Okay, we'll move on to item, let me find where I am, four. And Cassandra, we'll go ahead and have you tee that up also. Hi, um, Chair Dillon. This item is to evaluate the labor market compensation data from current and alternative pay comparator groups for benchmarking salaries um, under the board's statutory um, authority. At the February committee meeting, Adam Barnett, head of asset management at McLoggin, continued discussion on assessing the current pay comparator group used for benchmarking salaries. The committee directed Mr. Barnett to provide salary analysis with a side-by-side -side comparison using three approaches. The first approach was our current uh, blend of 67% of public funds and a 33% of private sector funds in the uh, salary analysis. Alternative two was presented last at the last meeting, which included a group of leading institutional investors um, as proposed in the presentation from that meeting. Alternative three was the same as alternative two, but with additional um, public fund organizations included. And then we subsequently also added TIAA CREF with the discussion um, from Chair um, Keeley. So Mr. Uh, Barnett is here to present the labor market survey results as requested, and he's right here. Thanks, Cassandra. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, so we, this, I think this is the second or third time we've met on this issue. We've gotten feedback from the, from the committee in past sessions. Um, again, the topics to, to help to define the compensation comparator group. As Luis had mentioned, this is something that, that's typical in public funds every few years and private sector firms, again, every few years. Um, uh, Mr. Rosenstiel, you had asked a question. I think uh, we missed each other at the last meeting, but we'll go back to the appendix. You, you had asked questions, uh, pointed and very good questions. We were somewhat flat-footed when you first asked it about, like, why do we want to do this? This is just a, a painful process, and it takes so much time. And do we really need to engage in this? So there's some materials in the appendix which really are intended to identify like, why are we here? And even though it's out of order, we're just going to flip through this because I think it sets the stage for this discussion in a, in a fairly uh, meaningful way. So I'm going to flip the page and we'll be, and we'll, so there were, again, to Mr. Rosenstiel, when you had asked the question in the, uh, I think it was maybe in the January session or the December session, why do we want to do this? It's, this is like, we're looking at pay again. This is a difficult topic. It's a complex topic. It's not easy. And there, again, there are, are, are four reasons. One is to exercise sound uh, pay governance. So again, the, uh, as board members, presumably you want to know where the organization stands with respect to pay. Are we high? Are we low? And this notion of uh, ignorance, ignorance may not always be bliss. You really have this fiduciary, we would think, have this fiduciary responsibility to understand well, are we paying our people high or low? Are we, are we in the market? So it's to exercise sound pay governance. To reaffirm the, the human capital strategies of the organization, I mean, uh, over time, we worked on the similar project probably 10 years ago, so there's been lots of, of change in the, individual, the composition of the board, and there may also be changes in the perspectives about pay of individual board members to really to ensure that the pay philosophy, the pay strategy, the pay comparative group reflects the current board, mem board members' perspectives with res uh, in terms of pay. To reflect the investment and operating approaches of the organization, which we know, again, have changed and, and may change in the future. And then also the, the economic environment uh, continues to change. So it's to, to, uh, to make sure that the pay strategy is consistent with your objectives and the environment. Um, 
this is a big this is from our perspective is a big one and it ties into fiduciary responsibilities to manage um you i'm sure spend lots of time managing all types of investment risk and systems risk and operations risk and insurance you know all different types of of structural related risks and your members i'm sure would want you to again be on top of the employee related risks so that in terms of understanding where the market stands is to ensure that you can monitor and manage employee related recruiting and retention risk will the people that you're depending on to satisfy the pension promise will they be in their seats and to be informed on that there's a chart here this is just um it's not a systematic survey but a uh, sur survey uh sort of a system sort of a, uh, a compilation of indicating over the over the past few years and we just focused on the cio position because it's the one that that hits the hits the press most frequently. So despite this, this thing that we've had called this, this financial crisis, the market for top investment talent um, remains strong. So for top performing investment talent, you'll see in, this, in the exhibit here that there's an ongoing flow of, of, of talent, principally from public funds, to a whole range of, of institutional investors, whether outsource CIO firms, whether to endowments and foundations, whether to big family offices. Um, but despite the fact that, the, that there's the view that we're still you know, uh, licking the wounds of this economic crisis, the, the market for top talent does, um, has remained strong. And this is just facts to, to support that view. With regard to this chart, um, it, it appears to tell one side of a story. But what do we know about the back side of that story in regards to um, the people they were able to bring in to backfill those vacancies and the subsequent performance after that. We can't speak to we we can't uh, we can't speak to the I mean the the whole performance issue is one that's again very challenging to, to comment on, but they they have been able to fill slots in many cases through internal promotion. And, and I guess is that a bad thing? Not not necessarily. But I, the, the only point we're making, we're not saying that the organizations have not been able to fill spots. We're basically saying that if there's a view that we've had this, we've had um, this financial crisis and that their jobs are not, there are no jobs to be had, it was illuminating to us to actually do this, to, to, to do the research and see, well, how mobile are these roles and are these positions in demand and are, uh, is the private sector looking to public funds to hire people? And I think that, that in this analysis, it shows that, yes, that if I were a, a large endowment or I was a, you know, a, a large family office, I would view public funds such as CalSTRS as attractive places to send my recruiters to. And I guess my point is this is only sort of telling a, a, a story in isolation, and it doesn't provide the broader context of what happened after and how successful they were before and after. And sometimes the opportunities that a vacancy creates, you find yourself better off downstream than you were at the point in time that vacancy was created. And that's, right. my, that's my only point. You right. and, the only, and the only, and again, it's a multi-dimensional question. We're just basically saying if the view is that, that there are no jobs to be had, this is basically saying that, um, that there's, it's a very fragmented, yet the range of competitors is, is broad and fragmented. And that those competitors continue to hire. That's the that's the only point. So in terms of thinking about risk, it's a risk that the committee should, uh, uh, from at least from our perspective, to attend to. They all just fail, or were any of them? Uh, the ones, the ones that I, the ones that I know. I mean, I I know on the list personally, probably uh, a. A third of them, and I would say yes. Yeah. Chris? <laughs> I, I, I can't say none, but the, the, ones that, the ones that I know, I work closely with Mass Prim. I know Ken Lambert fairly well. I know uh, Sean at, at North Carolina. Yeah, when I looked on this list, there's only one that I wouldn't. Uh, they left, and then there was a, a minor train wreck after the fact, so they probably would have been asked to leave. But uh, I know most of the people on this list and all uh, moved on on their own okay. to other opportunities. Thank you. Does it go in the other direction? I mean, could you put together a, a table that showed private 
sector CIOs leaving or being recruited to the public sector? Uh, perhaps, uh, but uh, perhaps, and I'm sure that there are instances, but it's not when we think about the um, the instances. It's it's fewer. It's much fewer and far between. This it's such a fragmented market when you think about. Um, Endowment foundations over over a billion dollars, uh, big family offices with you know over a billion dollars, um, corporate plan sponsors. So it is. So it is. So, so to, to to say that there's it's a one dimensional view and it only the labor only moves one one way would be over would be an overstatement, a simplistic overstatement. But I mean, my experience is that you've always got people moving. I mean, I've you know I, I partner in an investment bank. We have we we attract people. We lose people. And sometimes when we lose people, it's actually we're we're sorry to see them go, but it it's 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 often a a reflection of the fact that we've trained them well, and now they're attractive to our 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 competitors. So I, I movement doesn't per se, uh, I think, cause a problem unless we've got a persistent problem of always losing our best people and not being able to attract. Good people to take their place, as, as Richard said. You know, what's the what's the the other side of the right. of the you know losing people? So. Yeah. Look, and our point is monitor risk, and and um, so if we go back to hope that hopefully that's uh, uh, more comprehensively answers the question that from the from your last. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we tr we tried to be res we tried to be responsive. Um, so that the um, um, you asked us to work to identify a, a peer group that could be used to to identify competitive pay levels um, and market pay levels uh, f for specific. Um, selected executive positions and investment management positions, and this would serve as a basis once that peer group was identified and, and um, approved by the committee, that would serve as a basis for defining the salary ranges, anchoring the salary ranges in, in the market. Um, and there are several, uh, there were several peer groups that were reviewed in prior discussions, um, and um, as follow-ups to committee requests, we're basically um, um, reviewing the proposal a proposed peer group uh, deemed to be leading institutional investors um, and reviewing, as requested, the results of pay, pay level analyses comparing um, CalSTRS current actual pay levels and your well, what's referred to as your policy pay, which is essentially your salary ranges, to the market pay levels of your current peer group, meaning no change. We're going to leave everything alone. We don't want to engage in this discussion. Just leave, let's stay with the 6733 blend. How, do, how does our current policy compare with that? And then secondarily, if we were to embrace this, um, this group of leading institutional investors, um, how would our actual pay levels compare to them? And what would be a salary structure that we might have if we're anchored in, anchoring our pay to that peer group? So that's, that's really the meat of what we would um, hope to discuss today. Any questions? So, in this comparison, did you um, quantify the benefits of civil service to the extent that the employees that are being discussed, the positions that are the focus of this study, are covered under civil service, and uh, the, the benefits, the job protections, that sort of thing? Uh, we didn't. We did not quantify the benefits. We also did not quantify the. You know benefits of working at a at the one of the largest and most prestigious institutional investors in the world. The benefits of of living and working in Sacramento. The we did not adjust for the uh, California taxes. We so this is just we just looked at uh, straight uh, pay. Okay, so in, in your definition of straight pay does not include, I assume, defined benefit pensions and a rather generous health care plan. The, the, the peer group data, um, what was absent from both the CalSTRS analysis as well as the competitor analysis, so it's apples to apples, was that the uh, the DB plan was not considered either the 
the incidence meaning of the current peer group, 67% of the other of the of the of the current 67% of the current peer group are public plans, which we didn't um, we didn't quantify the value of their DB plan, which gets into lots of assumptions. But we we were working under the assumption that other public other um, uh, other public servants in the in your peer group, this, the current peer group, also participate in DB plans. Not all of them are afforded the same civil service protections. So, so the, the 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 salary comparison puts those benefits aside, and you're just you're assuming that the, the value of those benefits are roughly comparable. That's that's correct. And we've had lengthy discussions. Uh, um, we've had lengthy discussions uh, um, with our clients, our public fund clients, um, about this subject. And once you start really peeling it back, and to say, how do we value? Uh, how do we value Joe's uh, DB benefit consistent with salary and, and bonus, or sal just salary? How do we ascribe an annualized value to that on a compensatory basis? And then we'll have people with, with <coughs> different lengths of service covered under different pension regimes with different mortality assumptions. So in this case, we say we don't have an easy answer uh, for you. We've, we've pursued this, and the best actuaries in the in in our clients have basically also raised their arms and said that they're unable to come up with something that's systematically um, accurate. So we don't have DB plans in your data, nor in the competitive data. And, and not to belabor the point, I just I'll close with this comment, and that is, in, in our work at the Department of Finance, we've looked at pension benefits in other states, and there is a great disparity between the benefits in California, um, two other states. Not every state. Again, th there's a broad range. So. Um, and, and not looking at health benefits or retiree health benefits. Those are all things that in the state of California we consider part of our total compensation package. So um, it's tough for me to look at data and, and look at it objectively when those kinds of critical pieces of our total comp package are, are left out of the mix. So. Um, as Cassandra had mentioned earlier, the current peer group um, is comprised of a select group of large and or complex public funds, U.S. public funds weighted 67 percent, and all private sector uh, asset management organizations weighted 33 percent, and it's just an arithmetic average of two, an a, weight, a weighted average of two data sets, public funds here, private sector here, and taking a 67-33 blend. Um, we don't believe, as we described in prior discussions, we don't believe that the current peer group is well suited to CalSTRS. Um, when we look at the at the current public fund peer group, you're far, far larger, other than of the of the uh, 15 or so other public funds in the peer group. Um, you're the second largest, and the, again, the 13 or 14 other firms are all much smaller, f smaller in many cases by a factor of 10. Um, so they, again. CalSTRS is far larger and more complex than the other um, public funds. It's um, when you look at particularly at the senior level investment positions, it's unlikely that um, that your um, employees would seek to go view as competitors to um, to most of those other public funds. Potentially CalPERS ex uh, aside, um, and then the private sector companies. Really, when we when we reflected on this. From our perspective, the private sector firms really are in different businesses than CalSTRS, meaning they have different uh, missions, accountabilities, uh, the jobs are different. Um, uh, one, could, one could argue or not argue, depending on the organization, that the risk-reward trade-offs are different. Um, there are sales and marketing responsibilities, um, particularly for, the, for the, some of the senior-level positions that are not resident here. Um, so instead, we, we're, we had advocated in prior discussions and continue to advocate looking at a peer group that's consisting of leading institutional investors, uh, missions that are similar to CalSTRS. They're all, if you look at the group, they're all, um, I don't, I think it's hard to argue that they, that they would not be viewed as leaders in, in pension and asset management, leaders and innovators, and, and as a result are more likely to be competitors for your senior staff. Um, and there's a list, sorry for the size of the, of the font. Um, there's a list of some 20-odd some 20 organizations that would represent that group. 
and there's a tally on the bottom of the page that essentially 10 out of the 27 some odd firms are U.S. public funds. And that was, uh, Mr. Boykin, you had asked for a greater representation at our last meeting, so I think that we added uh, four or five in, in, into the mix. Um, and if you can see on the tally, there are about 10 public funds. Uh, there are five Canadian pension funds. All, all of those are McLagan clients. Um, U.S. corporate plan sponsors. So again, they're uh, similar missions in terms of not trying to uh, um, raise assets as a business, but trying to um, uh, provide a pension promise. Endowments and foundations. So really some top-notch names in terms of uh, managing um, mostly endowment money. Um, and then insurance, TI Cref is an interesting one. They've um, largely had a non-for-profit mission and also, um, just like CalSTIR, served the, served the education market. So there's some, there's some overlap on a mission basis um, with CalSTIRs. If you look at the rankings on the bottom of the page, you see that uh, the CalSTIRs would still um, rank lo as large um, across multiple dimensions versus this peer group. Any questions? So what we did, uh, based upon your request, is we said, well, how, how, do, how do we compare? How do CalSTRS pay compare to, well, the current peer group? And how does it compare to this, new, this proposed new peer group? Meaning we don't want to accept this new peer group with, without understanding, are the numbers high or low? Or how, does it how would it change our positioning? So um, what we have, I'll, I'll use the pointer, hopefully. Uh, I can't use the pointer. What we've shown, the, what we did on this analysis, I'll, we're, we're going to go th take everyone through this systematically from the, um, um, from the left to the right. What we did is we said, um, if we're measuring competitive pay, we would take 29 incumbents, 29 individual employees at CalSTRS that we had the full range of market data for. And what you see in the column to the far left, in 2012, for those 29 people all together, so, for the, so the state would say, how much did we spend on, how much did those people cost us? How much did those people earn in 2012? And what you see is that the aggregate salaries, we add up all the salaries together for those people, they were paid $5.208 million. They were paid $5.2 million in the aggregate, those 29 people. And based upon their performance for that year, their, their, their salary plus bonus was $6.7 million. So there was essentially a, a $1.5 million in bonus or incentives that were earned and, and paid to this cohort, these 29 people in that year. That was their actual pay. So far, so good? So what's the aggregate amount of the compensation for these 29 people? And then for 2013, it's showing their current salaries. And then the, the, the total cash, it's showing their salaries, their actual salaries, plus their bonuses as if they were paid out at maximum. So this is what we would refer to as the moon and the stars number. This is if everything perfectly aligned, if Everything for all, all these employees over all time periods, over all elements of pay, if they got paid their maximum bonuses. This is the, I'm sorry to say this, this is the, uh, the walk on water number right here. So if everything was perfect, it would be $9.2 million would be the aggregate pay for that, this population. If you look at the current peer group, so we're not changing if we, we, we said we're dispensing with this argument, let's keep everything the same. The current peer group, 67 public, 33 um, private, the blend, you see the salary amounts for those same 29 people. You see the total cash amounts and the total comp amounts are including the value of, of stock grants for the private that are, that are embedded in this for the privately owned firms. And there are some publicly owned, there are some public, public plans that also have mandatory deferrals. So it's including the value of mandatory deferrals from some public fu funds, as well as the value of stock grants for the for the private sector firms. This does not, for both groups, to uh, Mr. Gillihan's uh, uh, observation, for both groups, we're not including the value of DB plans or civil service protection or retiree medical. 
it's not, they're not not on both in both groups. We're just looking at salaries and bonuses and direct other forms of direct pay. And if you look at for the public for the public uh, for the current group, you can see that your sal your current policy salaries approximate the competitive median of that of that group. Again, the 5.3. Uh, million dollars. And then if you look at your actual cash compensation, how much people actually took home last year, you were modestly above the, the low quartile. So if we're looking at, again, organizations going back to what was in that sauce, we have 67% of the peer group was public funds, and you were the second largest of that public fund group. So as compared to what are generally much, much smaller public funds, your pay was low quartile. In, two, in 2012, or approximating the low quartile. And then if we look at this to say, if, if, the, if you had top desk, I'm, I'm using, I'm, this is an, uh, a little shorthand, if you had great, great performance, if, if maximum payouts were had across all time dimensions, what shows here is that your total comp at $9.2 million would be, would be uh, modestly above the competitive median. So essentially what this shows is versus the current peer group, th this is to us in, in, a, in, a, in a colloquial sense, top decile performance begets median pay is how your current pay is designed. Top, core to top decile pay, top decile performance is begetting median pay of organizations that are smaller. The $9.2 the $9 million? That's the moon and the stars number. That's if everything happens perfectly, if, if the team just uh, knocks the cover off the ball and performance is spectacular over all time dimensions for every single person that's in the plan, that you paid maximum bonuses, right? So we're saying that's top decile performance. And this was saying that I'm giving you top decile, for top decile performance, look at the competitive median in the middle of the page. It's 8.3 million, so we said it's modestly above we're giving you top decile performance begets median pay, median pay of, again, going back to 67% weighting, sec you're the second largest, begets median pay of organizations smaller, less complex, less prestigious, so forth and so on. Questions? And then the, what we showed is the same, the same type of aggregate analysis. What? The same aggregate analysis is we looked at the, at the proposed group of leading institutional investors, and you see that the pay levels, the salary levels, are modestly higher. The incentive levels are appreciably higher. So this is, this is where we, this was the, when you asked the question, how, did, um, how does this stack up? What does this market look like? The punchline is that you materially lag your current peer group. So if, you, if there's no change at all, your current, they're, they're and if you said we embrace the current peer group on a policy basis, then this, then apart from this discussion of peer groups, this would this would naturally lead you to adjust your salary ranges. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all you were waiting for. Oh. Go, Michael. How do these groups compare in terms of performance? <laughs> Um, we we don't have we we don't have performance uh, data because when one and a much um, we could seek to work with staff to um, to assemble that the challenge that we would have with performance data is that if we were to look as an example and we um, if you said performance was defined by basis points of outperformance vis-a-vis -vis the policy benchmark if that's what you said was performance then we would say. The challenge is you have some organizations that are that are largely passive in this mix. So they may have performed great, but they're not generating alpha because they're not expected to, because they're basically passive, they're largely passive managers. Similarly, if we said how was how was our performance? Well, if you were comparing you to Yale, Yale probably did much, much better because they had much greater private equity allocation. And they're basically that they, they made that private equity allocation decision 10 years ago and are reaping the benefit of it now. 
so that there's moving parts relative to implementation decisions and asset allocation decisions. I'm not trying to hide, be, hide the answer, but it's, it's a complex one, which, which prevents us from answering that clearly. Well, I would back it up, Michael. It's a great question. You do get numbers on how we compare to public funds and public funds greater than a billion. That'll be in the PCA report on Friday. It also includes uh, all master trusts, which would be all pension plans. The problem with that one is the vast majority, it's almost 500 participants, and they're all much smaller. The, the median size of that is well under a billion dollars, so that's not a good group. The biggest difference of driver of performance, and the reason, as Adam's explaining it, it's going to be the risk, risk appetite of the fund. Um, you don't have, as a board, the same risk appetite as Yale, Stanford, and Harvard do, and that's what would have driven the performance difference. That's why the endowments were, you're all shaking your head, you know, the endowments were two-thirds private markets where we would not have been able to go there. So you would do have a comparison against the public funds, but you won't have a comparison against uh, the endowments. There isn't uh, a description. We do get data every once in a while on the risk-adjusted return and, and the return relative to the benchmark, and, and that alpha component would be the most useful. It's very time period dependent, as you can imagine. Yeah, he, he, here's my issue with, with this whole analysis, which is we seem to be missing the critical piece of the basis for the comparison, the talent. How do we measure the talent that we're looking at? Um, again, going back to you know, my, you know, law, law firm environment, you know, we used a very rough shorthand, top of the class, you know, and said, we, we assumed that the top of the class was the best talent. What does it take to attract that talent? And, and, and what I'm not hearing is how do, we, how do we identify whether we're looking at the right talent? I mean, I could look at this and saying everybody else is overpaying. And, and, you know, we're, we're, we're getting more bang for our buck because we're getting really good. We, we've got really talented people doing really good work, and we don't have to pay them as much. And our, and our turnover rate is, doesn't seem to be that high. We don't seem to be losing people. And, we, and if we lose them, we, we seem to be able to find people with, uh, you know, a, a relatively same talent. So why are we That's looking to pay more for the same talent? It's a, it's a, question, it's a legitimate question. It's a question of sustainability. Is this a and it's the question to go back to risk if you if you're saying this is the this is the market and the market was defined as even the current peer group and we're and we're just informing you head, just heads up your pay levels are very very conservative relative to that peer group if that's the position you wish to take that well, I, mean, I, mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is uh, is is our turnover rate too high are we losing more people than we should be losing. I mean, I, 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 Chris I, I talked I, about this in the last board meeting. We yeah, yeah Chris, remind us. Uh, yeah. you, you had a chart the last time that I'm, I'm, I, 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 refresh I'm, I'm, Yeah, I'd like to have all the, all this pulled because I, I guess I'm reacting to um, uh, what I'm reacting to, and, and please don't take this personally at all. Is is a formula that says, you know, we we we're we're not paying enough because other people are paying more. There's got to be more to that analysis than that. We're, I'm also, we're, we're not saying that these numbers are, I just want to be very clear. Uh, we're not saying that this is right. We're not saying that these people should be making this. We're not saying that teachers should, we're basically saying, this is what other organizations, these are facts of what other organizations are paying. And it's the, it's the committee's decision to, to say, uh, based upon those facts, um, to what extent do you wish to be high or low or at market relative to those norms? And and what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, the answer to that question depends on the impact of those on our workforce. This is as you say, the the turnover of our workforce, the quality of our workforce. You know, do we have the people that we want? Are we losing good people? If so, why? Where are they coming from? Are they are there good people that we can replace them with? Et cetera, et cetera, and and um, I think this is this is very informative, but there are other elements that that I'm used to seeing that it, it you know I think this last discussion helps me understand why it's more difficult to identify these because there's no kind of 
set standard as to how to measure the quality of the various people that are out there because of all these various factors, the risk factors here, the risk factors there, so on and so forth. But, you know, and, and, and I'm coming from, you know, kind of a structured environment where there was a kind of a, an industry-wide uniform way of, 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 of measuring the quality of people on, on the, on the for, for public companies, there was a, you know, you, you, you kind of, you, you, there was another kind of metric people, you know, would, would measure the quality of the talent pool a different way, and are we getting the right talent pool this way, that way, but, but I guess what I'm not hearing is, is how do you, Chris, identify the talent pool that you're looking for, and Almost without regard to the to, to, to the metrics, is the pay level si significantly imp um, forget significantly impacting in any way, shape, or form your ability to recruit the talent that you need? to recruit the talent that you need? Uh, at the senior levels, the answer is yes. I am holding open four of our most senior positions pending what you would do in this because I didn't want to recruit those on the old salary scale depending, and, and so we'll go into the market and I would tell you it would impact it. We normally like to try and recruit like a director of global equity. We'll have internal talent, but we want them to compete against somebody who has already been the director of global equity at a Washington or a Virginia or another smaller state fund um, rather than having to compete against other junior people. In all deference to, to Paul's comment, I don't want, and I don't think you do, I don't think you want to train people on your global equity portfolio uh, of $70 billion. Um, the, to answer, you also asked the question about turnover. The turnover historically has been about 5% which is very low. Last year it was 10%, and I would tell you right now it's trending at 10% this year. Um, we are losing more PMs and IO3s than we had in the past. Most of our turnover in the past have been at the IO1 and 2 level. Um, and Richard, the, for this committee, you asked me to start putting together an investment staff departure report. That's in the closed session of the investment committee, so you probably have never had a chance to see that. Um, and I don't know that I've shared it with all the consultants at times, but that shows you your turnover rate. It shows you where you're losing people. And Richard, partly in your question, the investment officer series is a pretty unique group in the state system. Only about a third of those retire out of the office. Two thirds of them leave for uh, a number of different reasons. And then we tracked where they went to, how many went to a peer fund and how many went to a money manager. Um, and, and let's remember that after January 1st, as you know, the cap on that DB is 110,000, so. Yeah. Whatever level of attractiveness the DB plan had for the senior investment staff, it's lost it for, for new recruits coming in from on the outside market. Oh my God. I, I went back really quickly um, to our last, well, can I even say it if we talked about it in closed session last time? 
I think Never you mind. can, uh, there's a lot of stuff we've said open session. I guess I just wouldn't name the positions and the names, but, okay. but you have the stats on the number. Two went to peer, uh, of the one, two, three, four, five that we talked about at that meeting. Two went to peers and one went to the private sector. And that was just the five most recently. Yeah, two retired. Two, two retired. Two retired. But the, yeah, so far this fiscal year. Obviously, this is self-serving because I'm your CIO and this includes me. But I, I have constantly challenged this board all the way back to, to the year 2000. You have to decide because I have to manage whatever you implement. You have to decide, do you want to be the second largest fund in the country? Do you want to have to run into the iceberg to prove there's a problem? Or do you want to be proactive and do things before you have to get there? So I understand the issue of turnover and the challenge with that. I it will be a burden on your performance if you have to go through lots of senior investment staff turnover because you're only talking about the top three layers of the senior investment staff and a few other positions. So, yeah, yeah. go ahead, Michael. You yeah, because I, I guess I guess I'm because this this is the part that I think at least resonates more with me than the chart because it's it's. An identification of however you define the level of talent that you believe is necessary to run the largest teacher fund in the world, and and where those people are and what opportunities those people have, and that's a much narrower chart than this is. And, um, and 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 that may that may affect the levels below them, and that's fine. Uh, or you know we can discuss how fine that is. But 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 I guess I was reacting to a a an analysis that that seemed to be driving us toward a a a, a discussion of pay. That didn't seem to identify. That didn't seem to focus on talent. So that that's really it. Party, thanks, Perhaps I can clarify what my concern was a few meetings ago because it's this is extremely useful information, and it's very important that we know this. That we know what what the market is. We know what others are are being paid. That we know also what the implications might be in terms of the ability to attract and retain people. But in the end, what we're concerned about um, is, is performance. So the, the, it, it would seem that for us to make a decision that we should be paying more to our investment staff sh must be that we conclude that, that we won't have the same investment returns with, with the current that 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 our our investment returns will increase because otherwise why would we do it if we can get the, today's investment returns at a cheap price shouldn't we as fiduciaries do that and that's the that was the reason that I said why are we going through this because it it's it fairness maintaining consistency um, all of that I mean those those are those are important but ultimately we we should get something for paying more which which is should should we expect higher returns and that's what I don't think I'm not asking you because I don't think that's your area of expertise but I think that's the issue before the board if we were to make a decision. And I would just I would just frame this as uh, on a personal level, I don't believe that arbitrages are sustainable. I don't believe that that um, that you can uh, pay people a dollar, and if they can earn a dollar fifty or two dollars, that that you can willful willfully and deliberately and confidently expect that those people will be there. I agree. So that I think that the utility of this, again, we can't, uh, Chris can speak about turnover. Um, we believe that our job for you, we work for you, is to give you the facts to let you know that 
um, where you where you're currently sitting, we put up um, we put up the the red danger sign to say that you're low and it's and you yes it's you say we're we're getting by and it's we're, we can be very frugal and it's good for the state and it's good for our members but we're saying that you're just embracing risk and I think we mentioned at the last meeting it's kind of if if it was your family office and you won the you know the won the Powerball and it was three hundred million dollars or four hundred million dollars would you want to have the cheapest possible manager or would you want to have the the most competent one at reasonable wages? And I and I guess it depends what our investment strategy is. If 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 I was wanting to invest in in index funds, I'd just go to Vanguard. Exactly. <laughs> so. so I mean, it's also huh? so also it's also so it also is a function of of what kind of an investment strategy we want to have. So, right. I have three more people. Adam, hang on. Okay. Are you done? Are you done? Paul, you good? Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you put in. I appreciate all the data you brought us over the last couple of meetings. Um, you know, this is this is risk monitoring. It's a good exercise to go through. I think some systems would have shied away from even doing the comparison. But, you know, it's always difficult to do. Having said that, I, I want to say before I ask my question that Treasurer Lockyer really isn't there yet in terms of seeing that our current comparator group isn't working for us. But one of the questions I did want to ask is, adding endowments into the mix, what do we know about their pay practices, how that compares, how, how much sunshine is there, and you know, what sort of governance is there? Yeah, I'm, there? I'm sorry we, don't, we didn't, uh, I'm sorry we didn't bring it. It was in the, um, in the, uh, in the appendices to the, in the last two reports, there was a, there was a list from, um, of uh, IRS disclosures, endowment by endowment, yeah. which was we, uh, again, it was many of them are our clients. We provided it because it was publicly disclosed, and we wanted you to have a more tangible. You used to talk about sunshine. That's right. you, that's sunburn. Uh, that you saw that that list there. Yeah. Most of the the endowments um, for a for a CIO a. a, a there's no two hundred. There's no two hundred billion dollar endowments, but for a uh, for a you know a five billion dollar endowment, the CIO gets paid uh, you know a million and a half, two million dollars. Thank you. So I really appreciate you know Paul bringing up this issue around kind of our what's what's our what is sort of our investment policy or kind of our way of thinking about invest, investing head, headed forward because I've been thinking about this a lot and we can talk about this more in the investment committee as well. But when I think about being a fiduciary of the system right now, um, what I want to see happening with our investment staff is I want more in-house. I want to save money on, on fees and third-party fees and I want innovation. I, you know, I know a lot of us you know, spend a lot of time listening to economists and, and colleagues in the financial world. And um, I personally think that you know, our investment staff, we're going to have to get creative and thoughtful, obviously bearing in mind risk and not making foolish decisions. But I want staff who have a spirit of innovation, who can think differently about the investment world and how do we make returns in a climate like we're facing right now um, uh, with the interest rates where they are. and and. So I think, I guess I have a different perspective than some of the folks that have spoken. I, I personally, I want us to, to be able to attract the quality and caliber of in a kind of investment staff that have that kind of innovation, that kind of creativity. Um, I, I have a lot of confidence in our current investment staff, but um, I am, I do think we pay our folks lower than we should be paying. I think we should be looking at um, compensation and increasing compensation for our investment staff because I do want to create a culture. I, I hear what Paul and, and Michael are saying about we want to have a good bang for our buck, so we want to we want to pay for performance. But um, I also want to attract staff that have that spirit of innovation. I want them to work for us and not work for a third party. So, so I think when we think about our investments moving forward in the next five years, that's. Um, I want to be hearing from investment staff. How are we thinking differently? What are what are some of the innovations ar around infrastructure and um, 
are we thinking differently or creatively about new investment strategies that will help us, um, you know, get our assumed rate of return? And that's that's what I want to see happening with our investment staff. And so, again, I, I'm 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 a big. You've heard me say it. I want I want more in-house management. I I it makes me crazy that we pay people um, third-party folks. We pay them and they don't give us the kind of return that we should be getting. So that makes me crazy. I'd rather pay our CalSERS staff. Um, but I also do think that um, I want to promote innovation. I want to promote creativity. I want to get the best of, of the class um, at working for CalSERS. And I, I think pay is a part of that. And um, so those are my thoughts. So, Adam, we're back to you. Sure. So, uh, we went through this competitive pay level analysis, and then the question was, okay, if we have this market pay data that's, now this is aggregated for all positions together, what would happen if we looked to see if we kept um, our current pay, current peer group, and we looked at the, at the, this proposed peer group, what would happen to the salary structure? So, how does that look at individual positions? Um, so again, as we've, um, I'm going to just show you the salary structure. We'll go back to a page. So we had recommended looking at lots of numbers on the uh, lots of numbers on the page. Just if we look at just to, so it's all clear what what we're doing here. If you look at the investment director column, uh, it's, see those in the middle of the page, investment directors. See that? Yes. And what, we're, what you see there is the policy is showing CalSTRS current salary range, the minimum, the midpoint, and the maximum. This is your current salary range. And the little blue hash marks are the actual salary levels of the people who are in those jobs. So that's kind of what you're currently doing. Your current salary ranges and your current actual pay. What sits next to that is the current. This would be the salary ranges if you, again, you haven't done this market analysis in, in three or four years. If you don't change the peer group and you just adopted the, the if you just continued with your current peer group, this is showing what the ranges should be consistent with your pay philosophy, your current peer group. And then the third set of, of floating bars is the proposed, is showing the salary ranges at the low quartile of the proposed peer group. So again, we look at the, at the proposed peer group, pay levels are materially higher. Those are pay levels that you can monitor and move to potentially over time. But at least initially, focusing on the low quartile of that peer group is the anchor point for your salary structure. And again, potentially moving over time based upon em employment experience, recruiting experience, moving uh, potentially closer to the median. But this is, this is showing those comparisons. And again, we, we were um, our proposal is the is the institutional group. So it reflects, from our perspective, more who you are. But if the current group was, um, if you may, if you continued with the current group, um, it would still what this would suggest uh, lead to an increase in the salary ranges. So, re re putting aside the issue of peer groups, the, the your current structure is um, out of kilter with the market. And again, our recommendation was to adopt this group as a basis for evaluating uh, market pay requirements, anchor the salary structure around the low quartile of the market for now, monitor uh, your experience recruiting retention, um, and perhaps in some time in the future migrate the, the salary structures uh, more consistent with the median. And this was the this is the resulting uh, salary structures. Any questions on the methodology or the rationale? Grant? So I just have a question on the parts of the results. The CEO, historically, we've had CEO pay has been targeted below CIO pay. Now it looks like our both our current per peer group and the proposed would put that significantly reverse that. Just wondering, in terms of other pension funds, other public funds, you know, I, there's a, it's a mix. Hmm, okay. 
some it's higher, some it's lower. I, that's a good question. <laughs> I just I think that's a change for this book. Yeah, yeah in terms of the, what market practice is, yeah. some it's some it's higher, some it's lower. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty. So I want to make sure that I have this straight because you know this is Harry's kind of been walking us down this road. So we have this for an action item. We've talked about it several times. We have a decision to make. We have decisions to make. We have the decision to stay with our current group or go with the newly reconfigured comparator group, which is what McLaughlin is recommending. And then, depending on which group we select, where we would put our salary bands within that comparator group. Yes. And do I need to refine it any more than that? Adam? No, there are some Sandra? there are some transition steps, but that's the the um, that's the, the we believe the essence of the decision. And that tra you're recommending that we do that at the beginning of next fiscal year, begin that transition, and have it fully implemented within a couple years. That's correct. All right, a th two to three year period. All righty, Grant. One clarifying question: If the committee does move toward the proposed methodology aimed at the low quarter. You know, I'm a little concerned because for many of the positions, that would be a lower base salary. So how would we, uh, we don't want to transition down. Right, so, right. right. The range, so it's the range. Yeah. We, look at the, we look at the chart um, here, the hash marks. It, it appears that all the positions are within the new, would right. be within the ranges of the new, of the new structure. Okay. Thank you. So what that would leave us with, would, would they would not have less salary. They would either remain the salary, but the potential to move upward is much greater than it would be if we remained where we were. That's, uh, the potential would be different. Yes. Some cases, okay. if you look at the, for the, um, at the different jobs, some it's similar, some it's more, some it's less. Okay. Uh, Chris. As you're deliberating this, I just I wanted to make a couple of statements. And first off, I've, again, I absolutely recognize they usually use me and my salary as the key up there. So it is obviously self-serving. But uh, I guess I want to appeal to you. I, I, I believe, and I've said to you many, many times in this board for a decade, that your investment staff are your most important investment asset uh, in the building, Sharon hit on a point, you pay $160 million a year to outside money managers. So the potential that you pay internal is a very small number. Um, to Michael's question, the proposed group is the one where we tend to draw talent from, and right now it's where we're losing talent too. Um, I would really emphasize, we recognize the environment and our need to raise contribution rates. The key is implementation over time. Um, and, and I really want to state for you and then the staff that's listening above, I absolutely want equality in the investment office. I do not want to be treated any differently than my staff. Whatever you do or don't do for me, I want translated down equally to the staff. We absolutely have to be equal. It can't be only for the top. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. All righty. We have an item up for action. We need a motion. Sharon? I make the motion to approve the recommendation. The proposed salary, the mm -hmm. proposed comparator group? Correct. All right, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, do you want to go ahead and speak to that, Sharon? No. I mean, is there anybody else that wants to weigh in on it before we take a vote? Um, Richard? Okay. I would just reiterate my earlier comments that I feel like this board is making a decision on a, a data that's only part of the story of total compensation. And I agree that we want talented investment staff um, the best we can get, but I'm not sure that a decision is being made on complete and comprehensive data. Sure. Can I comment to that? Is yes. That, okay. So I just wanted to comment on that because I do... I guess I would say that we've 
had extensive extensive conversations. This is one of I think three now or four board meetings four where we've five, dialogued about this issue, and um, I guess on, on the other hand, I haven't ha heard a good rationale for why we would stay with what we've had, um, and so I, I'm convinced that um, I'm convinced not just by this data but by multiple conversations I've had with our investment staff. So. So I don't feel like I'm getting one side of the story. I feel like, um, so I just wanted to mention that. Michael? Um, I just want to say the, the information that Chris repeated again is what I wanted to hear on the record. That, that, that's the key for me. And to Rich's point, I see this as just one part of the process. We, right. we are not going to slavishly apply this comparator group and and just move forward has got to be based on um, uh, th this is a framework in my mind this is this is a framework within which we will make the decisions um, but um, uh, yeah. that's the base upon which I'm ready to move forward uh, Richard and Ian go ahead and come on up and and I respect the, the opinions and comments I've heard of you I'm not disagreeing um, with your perspectives I guess Part of the problem for me is, and, and when we look at how we define a problem, it's not even clear to me that there's a, a problem. A 10% turnover rate doesn't seem exceptionally high, and I don't, I don't know what it is in the, the rest of the, the, this universe of talent and these comparable organizations, but if, if you look at the state of California, 10% turnover rate's quite a bit lower than, than most government operations. Um, and then... And then this question of talent, I mean, I, I don't even know what gets us the right talent. Does, does this benchmark get you the right talent? Is it 25% above that? Or, or do we even know that we're not going to be able to pull the talent in at the pay scales we have today? And so, sure. so I, I just feel like I don't have that information. Mm -hmm. And based on that, I won't be able to support this request. I am. Well, I just have to say that when someone like Mr. Gillahan says that you don't have adequate information, of course, my ears perk up as fiduciary counsel. So I guess I don't really understand your comment. The committee has met several times. It has two experts you know, that have been advising it. Experts have made a recommendation. None of the people on this committee are experts themselves on compensation. And under fiduciary law, they're required to rely up to a point on expert advice when they make their decisions. So it seems to me that they have plenty of information and unless your experts tell you that the information you've identified as missing is crucial or central to the decision that the committee is about to make, I just, I just don't see any basis for your remarks. Madam Chair, if I may? Yep. Uh, how, where, have, where have we defined that we have a, a recruiting retention problem? And maybe I missed that meeting. I apologize. I haven't been a party to all these discussions, so I'm talking about me personally. But I don't, I don't feel like I've misstated the information that's been presented well, today. Well, from what I understand, uh, and I've seen it, the staff provided uh, at the investment committee meeting in closed session information about retention. So that, that information is available. Your expert has also pointed out that we're talking about sustainability for the future. So we're not just looking at today or the past. And I think those are legitimate considerations for the committee to take into account. And, and Richard, um, um, we have been talking as a board about succession, um, not only through uh, throughout the whole um, organization. And, and for me, some of our conversations about um, succession plans kind of weigh into this for me also. Is there any, any other comments from anyone? All righty. Uh, we'll go to a vote. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to take the proposed uh, comparator group. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Nay. The chair votes yes. And is there, are there any abstentions? Then I would say the motion passes. Correct. All righty. Then going with uh, the recommendation of where to place 
um, the salary bands. And am I saying that right, Adam? The salary bands on the uh, on the comparator group. The, these uh, these uh, the ranges that you see here are are anchored at the low quartile of the comparator group. So the 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 these proposed salary ranges for the upcoming fiscal year are anchored on the low quartile, and we said that. You should monitor over time and as required and as appropriate is to consider adjustments. But the, um, but the current recommendation is to adopt these ranges. To adopt the ranges. All right. I need a motion to do so. Grant? Just a question. So I voted against the proposed comparator group, but now that we're here, is it ever you know, best practice to choose the low, the low quartile? I mean, if we truly say that this is the group that we compete with for talent, you know, I'm not sure why, why that was chosen, I guess, a little more of the rationale. This, uh, and the, if, uh, going back to like, uh, commercial decision making, the notion of saying, well, we have, uh, we're paying someone X, and then we wake up tomorrow and we, we decide we should pay someone 1.5X, I would share your s sense of uh, reticence or skepticism to say that's, that seems, uh, that doesn't seem appropriate. So we understand that this is the more appropriate labor market. We've, we've made those ca that case, and this is the standard to be on the conservative end of it, and then to monitor it and to adjust as required over time. And do we yet have a? It'd be hard to support. It'd be hard to say, um, go right uh, to the median. Given again, if you just say, are you ha are you having thirty percent turnover? No. So that's where we basically said to 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 take it in steps. Okay. And do we already anticipate when we would revisit where we should be? Yeah, I mean, the policy is always spoken to a two-year cycle for your work. And conforming to really what um, uh, Luis and Pat both said, then, obviously, it's your decision. So we thought, I mean, obviously, Chris will continue to do more turnover data. You should digest that. All right, with that, I'll make the motion to Alrighty. go with the recommendation to target the low quartile. All righty. And that would include ensuring that everybody's paid at least at the minimum of their sign and that anything that needed to be adjusted would be done over transition period. Yes, that's, that's what was describing here. All righty. For, so for incumbents, the third bullet point, for incumbents that were salaries below the range minimums, adjustments must inform whether you have year-over-year -year increase guidelines, but they should reach the minimums uh, over two or maximum three-year period. All righty. So there's been a motion. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. The chair also votes yes. Thank you. The mo chair, any abstentions? An abstention. Yep. And we have an abstention. Okay. The motion passes. All righty. Next item. Oops. Lost my index, guys. Sorry. I need to make sure I'm on the right meeting. Nope. I wasn't. I'm back in February. Okay. Okay, April. All righty. Um, Cassandra, I think we come to you for your report. I don't have anything Review of information requests. I don't think we had any. Draft agenda for the next committee meeting. So on the agenda, um, we will come back with the policy changes that will reflect the, ch uh, the uh, change in the comparator group and the market positioning of those um, salary ranges. So we'll come back with um, policy uh, amendments at that time. And that's what that is reflected there. And we will also be coming back with the uh, recommended salary range based on our new peer group for our deputy CIO uh, position. Just make, I just need to, because I don't. No worries. The details of this. Yeah. Okay. No worries. And then that is opportunity for statements from the public. Uh, no, I'm, I'm 
I'm also a member of the public, but actually I wanted to follow up with, uh, with, with Jack's comment. But I, so I see the draft agenda, but that's contingent upon the yeah, board. board approval. Yes. All right. So, okay. Just want to make so that this sure. So this is going to be a recommendation Vision. for us to the full board. The board. Like any committee motion, like any committee report motion. to the committee okay. to the board. The board would choose then to adopt the committee's recommendation. I just or want. Not. I just wanted to clarify that for the members of the committee. On Thursday. Tomorrow. Again. Alrighty. Any other statements from the public? Seeing none. Uh, the committee is adjourned.